Hello everyone, thank you for tuning in. Again, I am Kaylee Batesman, the Content Director at She Can Code, and today we are discussing women leading in tech and anti-money laundering. We're delving into the world of technology leadership with Alyssa Ayer, Head of Product Anti-Money Laundering Solutions at Lynx, uh, who is going to share her insights into navigating the complex terrain of anti-money laundering in global financial institutions. Welcome, Alyssa. Lovely to have you on here. So great to be here. Thank you. Thank you for joining us. I know you're a very busy lady. So um, thank you so much for taking some time out to come and have a chat with us today. Um, we're going to get started with a bit of context about you, if that's OK. Um, a little bit. Can you share a little bit about your journey into the tech industry um, and what initially drew you to to the field of anti money laundering uh, operations? Yeah, thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me. It's great to be here. Um, it's interesting because I actually got into the field of anti-money laundering operations right after I graduated uh, from my grad degree in 2013. It was at the height of AML regulation. A bunch of consent orders were coming out. Basically, regulatory actions were coming out of the U.S. government. And a lot of banks were hiring and I actually got hired by JP Morgan as an associate compliance officer. And I was doing uh, transaction monitoring investigations uh, for correspondent banks. And that's actually a pretty risky product um, where the compliance standards were quite high. And through that experience, and then moving on to PwC, where I did a lot of different projects with very large uh, financial institutions, I really learned various different processes, risk appetites, policies, so on and so forth, challenges, and how things were either being solved with technology or they weren't. And a lot of what is done today is still quite manual in AML investigations. Um, it, some of it is a necessary evil. Some of it is that, you know, we, we've really needed to get to a point where we are today, you know, with LLMs and Gen AI, where, where we now have the technology that will help us to expedite some of these quite manual processes. But um, throughout all of these experiences, I've been able to understand where the pain points are for these really large institutional clients with very large uh, resources and staffs. Um, and so I've been able to learn a, a, a ton through that consulting experience which I now have am able to apply in technology. And so basically the journey was, you know, I, I had such a great experience in, in consulting, learned so much, but um, I was at PwC for seven years. It was an incredible experience. Uh, and then I was really at a crossroads when I had my first little one and I really wasn't sure what I wanted to do, honestly. I wasn't sure if I wanted to stay home with my little one, if I'd re-enter the workforce, but at about 10 months postpartum, a cyber-focused uh, venture capital firm, Forge Point Capital, presented me with the opportunity to come work with them to map out uh, kind of the know your customer and anti-money laundering tech landscape um, to help them pinpoint areas for investment potential. And it was an incredible opportunity for me because in my consulting experience, like I said, I learned so much around the pain points, around potential technology solutions to those specific pain points, but it is really difficult to pick your head up out of the weeds, out of client services to look at what's happening in the broader ecosystem. Um, it's, you really should do it, but for myself, it was it was hard to find the time to really do that because it was a full-time job at ForgePoint. So how do you do two full-time jobs um, you know, at the same time? And so it was an incredible opportunity for me. Um, and that's where uh, that opportunity at ForgePoint um, uh, helped me uh, learn about links where I'm currently leading AML and uh, I've been able to take the pain points that I pain points and potential you know solutions that I really learned about in consulting and, and where we implemented 
some short-term and some longer-term solutions to those pain points. And now at links, I'm uniquely positioned to leverage that business knowledge to inform both product design and go-to-market strategy. Amazing. And way, way back when uh, you were studying at university, um, did, uh, what I'm curious to know is, did somebody inspire you to go in that direction? I mean, you're obviously very passionate about um, your your role and and uh, the way that your career path has, has panned out. Was there somebody that you kind of looked at and thought, oh, you know what, that sounds cool. I really want to do that. I will have to. I will say one of my directors, my initial directors at uh, at a, a due diligence firm, one of the first investigations roles that I had, her passion for uh, investigations, for finding the you know adverse information, for just being thorough in your job, and for being you know for bringing your best self to work and to bringing the best quality to work, just her dedication to that and how she worked the room. Um, she was a huge uh, uh, influence and she she had a huge impact on my career because I thought, I want to be like her. I want to not only have so much, uh, so much passion for my job, but also to have this impact on other female leaders, not only as a as a BA, you know, businesswoman, but also as a mom and uh, a working mom. She just, yeah, she really, she really inspired me. Yes, amazing. As it was, yeah, it's nice to hear when people have great role models, especially female role models, because we need more of them in the workforce. So people can look to them and, and almost see their next role or kind totally. of see that, that type of person that they want to be. And like you said, not just um, in your job, but at home and um, uh, and, and all aspects of, of your life. Mm -hmm. um, I wanted to ask you a little bit about being a female leader in a male-dominated industry. What unique challenges have you faced throughout your career and how have you overcome them? Yeah, it's... Um... I've had a lot of challenges, both non-gendered and gendered, just given financial services and consulting is, is really difficult and, and it's helped me to grow as a professional. Um, and it um, it's really helped me to grow as a professional because of those challenges where you have to use um, different problem solving skills. But I'll share some experiences that may be helpful for some, some listeners. Um, one, one challenge that I experienced at one of my first consulting projects was being a young leader amongst older, more experienced, a large majority of them were, were men. And, and it was incredibly intimidating and difficult because here I was, my first project, um, I was, I, you know, I, I was so young. They were so incredibly experienced, like 30 to 40 years um, more experienced than myself. And I had to prove myself through hard work and dedication. But once I earned their trust, they were incredible mentors who shared their knowledge, helped me to grow and advocated for me when I needed it. Um, and so that was a very difficult, uh, uncomfortable at first situation and challenge, but it eventually helped me to grow into the the eventual leader that that I am today. But of, co of course, not all of my experiences were like this. I often experienced gender bias as well, um, and unfortunately, that's not a unique challenge because I, I think a lot of us have to deal with this in a male dominate in male dominated industries. But example, but one example of that is uh, one that I like to give because it's so simple, but it is so frustrating. Is when you, as a lady, are asked to take notes or to plan an event even though you are the most, one of the most senior individuals in the room, but you're being asked to take notes or plan an event because you're just good at it. 
And somehow, because I'm a lady, I, I'm just really good at this. I don't know how this bias has come about. Yeah. And, and if any men are listening, this may sound small, but as a, as a woman, when you're constantly asked to do this, even though there are men in the room who are not a senior and are not asked the same thing, it starts to become a pattern. And it is just so frustrating because you could be using your time to do other more valuable things because you are at that level of seniority where your time should be used there. And yet you're asked to do this one thing because it seems it is your gender. So I ask of my male allies out there, non-gendered allies to really check your biases um, and be self-aware. Um, and, and in terms of how I've overcome that in the past, you know, when you're, when you're not a senior, um, it's really hard to give that feedback, um, in the moment because you don't feel as confident. Um, but now I, I look back at those situations and I think I wish I would have been a little more direct in giving that feedback and don't make it personal. Just say, hey, I noticed I've been asked to take notes. I have no problem doing that. I always do that for my own personal self. But just so you know, you know, there are other few people on the team maybe who could do that as well um, and really push to uh, give that responsibility across the team so that you're not always the person who they who they go to just because you're quote unquote good at it. And if you're good at it and you like to do it, that's great. But if you see a pattern emerging, nip it in the bud. Yes. Uh, you know what, what you just said to me, a male ally said something similar recently on this podcast. And um, it was actually about his wife who was in a senior leadership position. And he said, every time she was in a meeting, they used to look to her to take the notes and luck would have it for her. Somebody in the room noticed and said we don't need to keep asking you to take notes or don't assume that you're going to take them because she she was starting to assume every meeting she was going to be that go-to I'm going to take that right. and he actually called her out and said no we're going to pass that around somebody will take minutes it's somebody different each meeting don't always Incredible. assume it's you and he uh, the guy that I was talking to he said she was so relieved that somebody had noticed because instead of you had to give that feedback yourself. Right. And whereas if somebody else in the room, a male ally would have just said, you know what, it's not just all on you. Totally. You wouldn't have had to have had that awkward feedback conversation. Um, so yes, definitely agree with that. Um, and, uh, and it must happen to so many ladies um, where, and you're absolutely right though, speak up when, when that happens and don't always just assume it's you taking the notes. 100%. And, and on that theme on allyship, just one more challenge I wanted to highlight was um, I, I wanted to mention I've had some incredible mentors and supporters, both female and male, supporting me throughout my career. But uh, one example that I will never, ever forget is meeting a senior female executive at a workshop uh, and her asking my colleague right out why there weren't more females around the workshop table when because when she met me she said oh well why is she not at the table there's clearly capable females here and I thought wow what a boss um and, and I was so and then of course I was immediately invited to the workshop within the next few hours and it was disappointing, to be honest, that it took her saying something to diversify the voices around the table. But her saying something in her level of, um, you know, seniority, uh, it helped the men in that room see what they could not see before. Uh, they, of course, wanted to impress her. They didn't want to offend her. But it's like, well, what? environment are you inculcating here if you're not inviting us to the table from the get-go um and so I vowed from that day that I would raise these issues in a constructive way to increase diversity and rep representation when when I needed to um 
you know, in, in other instances, I, I really haven't had to because there's been incredible female representation around the table, which I feel very lucky, lucky to have experienced. But in that, in that experience in particular, I just thought, man, the impact that woman not only had on mine and other females experiences for the duration of that job and the lasting respect that I will have for her will never leave me. Yes. And and even just pointing that out to a room that might not have even realized that that's the thing. I mean, when you started totally your, your leadership journey, you mentioned that you've had some brilliant um, male and female uh, leaders as as well and that and actually a lot of those um Mao uh leaders that that you found that your leadership team were mostly Mao you you said that a lot of them had been really good advocates for you so when you're not totally. in the room the people that are putting you forward and bringing up your name when it should be brought up when you're not in the room so a lot of the time it's it's having those great advocates who yeah. sometimes don't even realize that you know it takes somebody just to speak up and say hey have you made me thought about you know the representation in this room um and no nine times out of ten those people say you know what we hadn't even thought about it we we were so wrapped up 100%. in our day to day and that is all it is that is so right and I think that that's where self-awareness is so key in testing those um and, and really understanding do we have net like the necessary representation around here and the right mix of voices uh, based off of merit, of course, but then looking at like testing that unconscious bias, I think is really important. Definitely, yeah. Um, The World Economic Forum reports that only 22% of AI professionals are women. What do you think are some of the key factors contributing to this disparity and what steps do you think can be taken to address it? It's a great, it's a really great, great question. I think part of it, again, is this unconscious or conscious bias at work, thinking that science or math is too hard or not interesting for women. I think that that has been disproven um, today because I think that society has taken great steps in terms of ensuring that STEM is for everyone. Um, but also female accomplishments just haven't been at the forefront until recently to challenge these notions. I'll take a Brit, for example, Rosalind Franklin, a British chemist who was essential to elucidating the structure of DNA, wasn't credited for her work during her lifetime, but, um, but now we're finally uncovering these quote unquote hidden figures to borrow the name from Disney <laughs> to, to, we're bringing them back to light um, to the present day. And this is where um, I think we really have to be, um, we really have to not only bring to light those figures to show, hey, this has been a constant thread, a genius females in the field, but also we have to do more to support women in the field. So in addition to 22% of AI professionals only being women, as of 2019, only 14% of AI paper authors were women. Only 18% of authors at the leading AI conferences were women. And just 2% of venture capital was directed toward startups founded by women. And so... We all, not just women, but men, non-gendered allies, have to promote papers, panelists, funding for women as well. Um, The 2% figure just kills me. We have to do better to support women. And that's where I'm so incredibly proud to be a part of a team at Lynx and a Forge Point Capital portfolio company because at, at Lynx, a third of our engineers on my team partic- in particular are females, it, which is incredible yes. in engineering. Um, the, and they're all Spanish. So I'll, I'll have to give a ton of credit to the Spanish, uh, <laughs> the Spanish uh, school system for really supporting these ladies in, in STEM. Uh, but also 50% of our leadership team, they're female. And then from a force point capital perspective, 
uh, several of their founders are female. And so we all have to take these collective steps to advocating for women, not only in engineering, but in funding at conferences, on panels, to try and improve some of these really disappointing stats. Yes. And it's something we say on this podcast often, but companies that build teams like that, that is not something that is done overnight. That is totally something that takes a long time with a great culture and you know it has to be built from from day one um to be able to achieve that because you don't hear it often <laughs> couldn't agree more couldn't agree more um you've mentioned a a, a lady already um who had quite a, an impact on on your career um could you highlight some piv- pivotal moments or experiences that have played a significant role in shaping your career trajectory Absolutely. I have had the great opportunity to have some fearless (laughs) ladies in my corner, not just ladies, also male advocates, like I mentioned. Um, But it's, it's really, it's, uh, it's funny, because each of us has imposter syndrome, each of us has, um, you know, difficulty taking risks, especially when we don't have that confidence and having those advocates in my corner, you know, at every turn really helped me to have the confidence to take those risks. So, and and they honestly turned out better than I expected and then benefited me greatly, but it's because I had that support. And I know that I'm so incredibly lucky to have had that. And it's not that way for everyone, but, but I want to highlight that just to show how important it is that we ladies support each other rather than cut each other down. Because I've also had some really, really hard, challenging times where other women have just been so toxically competitive where it's like what are we doing here this is ridiculous we're we've already got the cards stacked against us let's not let's not add to it and so what I would say is you know having those advocates in my corner especially those ladies who leveraged their experiences and and gave me confidence it was it was so incredibly helpful for me then to take calculated risks that then benefited me. For example, moving from a bank to consulting was huge. Um, it was it it made a ton of sense because I took uh, the problem sets that I saw at FIs and then took it to PwC and then was able to build upon it. And then moving from consulting to VC to product, that was huge, but it was having the foundation from my experience set, but then also that confidence that I built in myself, as well as um, from those advocates that I've had was so, so important because I'm getting better at humbly and confidently working a room or presentation not only because of the practice, which I've, you have to put in the practice, but also because of my professional and personal hype squad who has lifted me up over the years. Definitely. We actually have a webinar coming up about that because it is a a topic that is so important. Um, Ours is about um, a lift as you climb because you're absolutely right. There There are so many stories coming out about ladies who felt like they had um, leadership teams that were against them or they felt competitive or they, they somebody below them might have been an, a, a threat to their position maybe. And I, I, I completely agree as well that that is, it's a learned behavior. If, if you have experienced that, then you will naturally go on and do that in your position when you reach a leadership position and you feel, you know what, I have to do that because that's the only way that I'm going to keep my leadership position. Whereas um, it's absolute rubbish because, as you said, we really should be helping each other um, and making sure that that doesn't happen and that um, you've been lucky enough to experience some brilliant ladies who have advocated for you. Um, and, uh, you know, just more of us would, would love to, to feel that. And when you do get in that position and you um, and, and, and you, you have that uh, opportunity to help other women 
then definitely do that. And um, you're right, just helping each other. And obviously at She Can Code, we advocate for finding a good network to do that. Mm. That's what we're about, building a community and sharing experiences and finding other ways to help other women, whether that is within your own company or externally as well um, and mm-hmm. finding opportunities there. Um, but you're absolutely right. I, I <laughs> That subject at the moment is so, so important um, when you do have that opportunity and you uh, are, are a leader, definitely lifting as you climb. Totally. And what I, I'll just add on to what you just mentioned, building that network is huge, but it can be so intimidating when you're just starting out in your career and you're thinking, build my network. I know like two people. Yeah. <laughs> um, so be patient. It has taken me years to build up that network. And sometimes it can be frustrating because you're thinking, how am I going to build and really uh expand my network. You have to do the work. You have to get out, especially for consultants out there, get out, network at different, um, different like industry events. You really have to pick your head up out of client work, especially, or if you're in tech, get yourself out, you know, go to a non-tech event, meet people in tech, out of tech, you really have to put yourself out there um, to start to build that network, especially like you said, maybe outside of your company, um, because who knows, you might leave and then you've got to rebuild that network all over again. Yeah. Um, and and so I would just say be patient, but also you've got to put in the work. Definitely. Yes, because I wanted to ask you about well, what advice would you give to young women who aspire to pursue leadership roles? Uh, in the tech industry who might feel discouraged about the lack of female representation. I absolutely agree. Building your network is is brilliant advice um, that, there. And I, I have been told by a lot of ladies who step into a leadership position that it can be quite lonely when you <laughs> step into leadership as well. Who do you share your thoughts with? You, you totally. don't want to spook your team. So what do you do? It, build that network and share it with other people that are feeling the same way that you're you're feeling I mean is, is that the any other advice that you would give to young women as to you know what it's, it's as you said be patient as well yeah it you took the words right out of my mouth it can be very lonely at the top and you have to find the people not only at the top who you can trust in and and um and really talk with openly, but then also your broader network. Um, A few other things that I would just say is take your seat at the table, both figuratively and literally. I remember when I was first starting out, that was a really big thing. It may have come from Sheryl Sanders (laughs) where, you know, um, you'd have ladies standing around the table. There's open seats. Take your seat. You deserve to be at that table. Your voice matters. We won't change the disappointing statistics if we don't step boldly to the table, even if there are few ladies amongst us. You're an aspiring leader and there are going to be other ladies who look up to you and think, I should sit there too. Um, I deserve that too. But not just advice for the ladies for the men and non-gender colleagues out there, be self-aware, be a, be aware when you're mansplaining, take a step back, give credit where credit's due. Um, and also like we've talked about, um, when you're in a position of leadership, use it to advocate for those who don't have a voice. Um, but also don't use their gender as a reason. They want you to highlight their accomplishments and value that they've brought um, based off of you know what they've done, not just because, oh, we need more female representation at the top. Um, I remember this one promotion cycle where a guy was worried he would be pushed out because my employer was trying to push for equal gender representation. It was phenomenal and a phenomenal initiative because unfortunately we need some of these initiatives to push it. But But I remember thinking, dude, I will beat you on merit in every single category all day long. You needn't worry about Mm -hmm. this (laughs) gender uh, equalization. Worry about yourself. But I also remember thinking, wow, where, where did this confident lady come from in my head? But it takes time. 
you have to put the work in mentally to build yourself up and boost that confidence. There are days when, when I'm not that confident and then there are days where I am. Um, and so um, it, it, it takes work to get to that point, but that will help you to boldly step to the table um, and be that um, aspiration for those other ladies to follow you. Um, and then just last thing is, uh, advice for my non-technical folks out there, and this is not exactly gendered, but you don't have to be an AI expert or coder to bring value as a leader to the technology industry. Um, you should likely be up to speed on the latest trends and things, but um, in my experience, the main buyers are looking for someone who can solve their problems and greatly appreciate people who can speak to those problems in terms that they understand who are speaking from experience. And so that's where I've been, I feel like I've been uniquely positioned where I can take that experience that um, I understand those pain points very personally and speak to that with my buyers. But then I can also speak with my tech team in terms of how we're going to use technology to solve those problems. So I just wanted to mention, like, don't be discouraged if you don't know how to code Python. I think I took one course and was like, I'm sorry, this isn't for me. I'm a languages person, like Spanish, I'm good, French, English, but Python and SQL, I'm sorry, I just... It's yeah. really hard. Um, it's really hard. And I give so much credit out to those to those uh, developers out there. A um, ton of credit. But uh, but yeah, I would just say take really understand the value that you bring to the table and leverage that. Yes, I, I love that because that is why this podcast was started to share the fact that you don't have to be technical to, to be in tech, to talk about all of the different roles. And your job title is one of those really cool job titles where you think that's super cool. However, I probably have to be really technical to work in anti-money laundering. <laughs> but just pointing that out that you, you don't have to be. There are so many roles in tech where you just need to know how to communicate and um, how, especially working as a consultant um but that is why uh this podcast was started to to really hit hard with that um so definitely uh agree with everything that you just you just said there um looking ahead what do you envision for the future of women in tech and what role do you hope to play in driving positive change and empowerment within the industry I am optimistic about the future of women in technology, but we can't be passive about it. We have to be active drivers of change to push for inclusion across the board, not just females in tech, but advocates for female women of color, non-gendered colleagues. We have to keep checking our own biases and ensuring that we're lifting all of the voices to the top. Um, and the role that I hope to play in this is leading and inspiring others by example to show that a non-technical mother of two with an even busier partner can succeed in this kind of role. And um, I want to advocate for those around me, not only at my own organization, but in tech in general. Um, just coming from RSA, I walked in and I thought, oh my gosh, there are so many men here, um, which is fine, but, and that's, you know, that's cyber, I'm an AML, but it was so shocking. And I give a ton of credit to those folks who are really pushing for greater diversification. Um, and I wanna be part of that change. Um, I, you know, I've had some really challenging experiences that have colored my journey, um, which I hope no one has to ever experience. And I'll, I'll fight tooth and nail to make sure it doesn't happen, at least um, within my, um, in my immediate surroundings. But um, I also hope uh, to motivate others to push their boundaries, to reap the rewards that can be at the other end 
of really taking some risks um, and putting yourself out there. So yeah, I, I, I do have an optimistic view of, of where we'll be, but we have to be the dri- drivers to really um, make that change. Definitely. And I completely agree with more people like herself sharing stories as well and just sharing that you don't have to be technical. You can be a busy mum. You can still be successful in tech. I think all of those things just help other people that are feeling the same way or they might want to transition into tech later in their careers and they haven't done it before and are thinking, can I do this? Um, and the more that people share their stories, I love on here that there are so many ladies as well that come on and, and um, when, when we're discussing whether or not they, they're, they're coming on the podcast, what they want to talk about, and so many ladies don't realise they have a fantastic story to tell. Yeah. And that's really lovely. But you think, you know, what, our community are going to love hearing about you. That, yeah. you know, that like yourself, that not being technical and and um, and still being successful and 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 finding um, a balance with family and, and work and, and all of those things is, is so important to share for our ladies to, to hear um, and to be inspired by. And the more that people share those stories that the, the better the more that ladies are going to be inspired and think that they can do it um and finding uh and, and thinking i need to find a good company as well that is going to support me um is the other thing um 100%. You're finding yourself not in a good company then there are good companies out there um that are looking to diversify their workforces so um the more that people hear that there are good companies and they can jump ship and go somewhere that is supporting them so could not agree more well, fabulous. We are we are already out of time, Alyssa. I could talk to you um, for a lot longer on this subject <laughs> because you do have one of the coolest jobs and one of the most interesting jobs that we've had on this podcast um, so awesome. far. So thank you so much for sharing um, and for coming in and having a chat with us today. It's been a pleasure. It's been wonderful to be here. Thank you. And to everybody listening, as always, thank you so much for joining us and we hope to see you again next time.